Hello everybody, my name is Michael Chesney from Helix Legal and welcome to our inaugural Build Back Better podcast. And we're very pleased that our first guest today will be Kate Raymond, the Assistant Commissioner for the, Q- the, the QBCC. And there's a lot of other words after you at that title, but we'll just we'll just settle that for the time being. Sounds great. So welcome, Kate. Thank you. And thank you for making yourself available uh, for uh, for this interview. Um, I very much appreciate it. And just in the, for the full disclosure, um, my background is, as you know, 22 years with the industry regulator. And during that time, prior to coming to Helios, during that time, I obviously had um, significant dealings with you. <laughs> just, all positive. All yes. positive, <laughs> all happy times um, when you were part of the legal and uh, contractual branch of the Department of Public Works or all, all the different names that uh, the department went through. So yes. that's just for full disclosure for everybody out there. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much for making the time. My pleasure. So before we get stuck into the questions, um, you were good enough to make yourself available for a Facebook Live session last year, and I ended up the session by asking a question that I'd like to commence with this time because it's a bit of a passion project of mine or passion issue, and as you will, you'd be aware that you've still got a lot of friends in the, work, the yeah. authority. So can you just give us a bit of a rundown, give me a bit of a rundown in terms of the health and well-being of the, of the staff and how you're monitoring and how things are tracking? And, um, you know, just, I just, just want to start on that note. Yeah, look, um, it, it has been a tough time, so I won't shy away from that, but the organisation has worked really hard to stay connected for all of our staff. Um, so from senior leaders through to team leaders through to team members, uh, we look out for one another and we support one another, which is it was just wonderful. It, it is a great workplace. Um, we have daily check-ins, um, regular short team meetings on Microsoft Teams. Um, we've got Teams sites where people can, you know, post things, try and keep things a bit lively and fun mm-hmm. as well. Um, our HR department worked hard to set all of that up to make sure that people felt connected and could still um, also recognise good work. And when someone was doing some outstanding job, we can post that and all, all celebrate in that. Um, so I think due to all of that, we actually stayed quite connected to each other, um, which was wonderful. Um, and it was really it was really front of mind and quite deliberate for the leaders of the organisation to make sure that, that connectedness of the staff um, was a focus. What 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 percentage of staff are back in the office at the moment? Is it- so we're about 30, 20 to 30 percent. Um, we say to our teams at the moment up to 50 percent. So some teams are at a full sort of 50 percent of the team and rotational staff and some are a bit more flexible depending on the nature of the work and the nature of the staff as well. So some work, it's more important to be in the office yeah, than other sure. work. Yeah, well, thanks for that. And it's, like I said, it's a bit of a passion issue for mine. So Because yeah. it would have been a tough year last year. It's a tough year for everybody, but for the industry regulator, for the you know, building and construction industry regulator having to um, navigate with their clients a, a pandemic, then a recession, uh, it doesn't get much tougher than uh, from that type of work environment. Yeah, look, at, when it first started, I think a few of us were sitting there thinking, is work going to slow down? Are we going to have enough to do? And then we were all busier than ever. So, yeah. Great. So let's just start on some of the issues. Um And there was a recent Courier-Mail article about um, the number of outstanding returns that were still waiting in terms of minimum financial financial requirements for licensing that they weren't all. Um, And there was quite a a large number quoted in the the Courier-Mail article, 40-odd thousand, coming up for uh, a due date by the, the end of this month. Yeah. So can you just expand a little bit on what's... Who's involved in that? Um, what, sure. What, what licensees are involved in? What's the present situation? Yeah, so our licensees are broken up into category based on their turnover. So we have what's called self certifying licensees, we call SC1, SC2. And it's a turnover up to 800000 a year for those licensees. And these are all contractor grade licensees as well, I'll stress with a QBCC Act license. Um, so those SC licensees have an annual reporting date of 31 March. By and large, all SC licensees will have that as their annual reporting date there are a few who don't so if you're if there's an SC licensee listening to this who thinks hang on I've been given a different date um, that might be the case it might be the case you receive a notice from us changing it 
um, going forward um, or you might have negotiated a different reporting date with us as well. Um, I will stress that that is a very exceptional circumstance um, to agree to a changed date. So for the SC licensees, um, annual reporting is something that can be done online and what it is is um, we call it a, a financial health check. So it's an opportunity for the licensee to fill out um, some short questions. There's around six questions in the online um form if that's how you're doing it, um, to work out, to make sure you've got the turnover, um, sorry, to make sure you've got the working capital for the turnover. Um, so that that's really all it is at that at that level, at the SC level. Um, it's fairly quick and easy to do online. Most of the feedback we receive is quite positive, that it, it was easier than they thought. Um, and we really, anyone who hasn't done it yet, very much encourage you to get on and do it before the 31st of March being the due date because there is regulatory action that can be taken. So what's, can you, so is there a bit of a grading in terms of the regulatory action or some sort of, you know, um, how, what's the, what, what do you, what will you be pushing, say, what buttons will you be pushing very early in the piece in terms of all general reminders or? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so we, we do have a published regulatory guide which um, sets out the steps that we're going to take. So we have said in that guide that for this year, we will issue two reminders to licensees about the lodgement after the 31st of March. So that might be an email um, just saying, hey, remember, you've got to lodge. Uh, after those two reminders, we will then start taking regulatory action. And the first step will be to focus on those SC licensees who didn't lodge in 2019. So they had to lodge 31 December 2019. And they also had to lodge have to lodge 31 March of this year. So if you're an SC licensee and you didn't lodge 31 December 2019 and you haven't lodged okay. 31 March yeah. 2021, you'll be first cab off the rank. Understandably. And the first action will be a notice of proposed licence condition and the licence condition that we will propose is of no new work. So you can keep doing your current jobs but you can't take on new work until you lodge your annual reporting. There will also be a condition to lodge by a certain date so that if that isn't done, the next step will be a notice of show cause to suspend um, if that licence condition is imposed. Now, of course, if you get a notice of proposed licence condition, the first thing you should do is go and lodge. If you think you have lodged and this is a mistake, contact us. Do not ignore this notice because it can result in you ultimately losing your licence if you just continue to do nothing. Um, so very important that you contact us if you think it's a mistake. So the ones at the front of the queue, so to speak, in which the QBCC will be taking pretty prompt action come to the, will be the, the licensees who have failed two years in a row to essentially meet the annual return requirements. Yeah, yeah that's right. And, yep. and that will be... Okay, and yeah. lead to a potential no new work condition. Yes. Now, we've talked about SC licensees. Yeah. There are, on top of that, there's our Category 1 to 7 licensees. So that's licensees with a turnover from $801,000 all the way up to, well, anything. Yeah. So Categories 4 to 7, for example, those licensees have a turnover over $30 million a year. Um, we have commenced the notice of proposed condition um, on Category 4 to 7 licensees. They actually had a reporting day of 31 December, yeah, 2020. So um, for those licensees who didn't lodge, we've already started that action. And they are our focus. They're, they're the biggest end of town. They're the ones with likely to have the most number of subcontractors and suppliers, likely that if they don't have the required working capital, they're in, they could cause the most harm to the industry. So that is our focus. Um, and we're focused four to seven, then three, two, one, and then the SCs. Okay. So the four to sevens. There'd be none of those who would not have previously met the 2019 requirements. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so, okay. That makes sense for everyone who's, who's watching or listening is that the, 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 your focus, your immediate focus or your, 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 your critical focus is on the contractors who could cause the most, potentially yeah. cause the most damage to uh, to, con to subcontractors and suppliers and consumers. Yeah, and now remember there's two aspects to this. So one is... One is just lodging, and that's something that can be done pretty quickly, is to lodge. Um, and for SC licensees, um, it's very quick, and there's a few more requirements as you sure. become bigger. Um, the next requirement is to meet the MFR, and that's to make sure that you have the net tangible assets and the current ratio that are required uh, for your revenue. So, we, so one of the differences between the annual return being the self-certified and the minimum financial requirements for licensing is once you get into that minimum financial requirements for licensing form, that's 
that's when your accountant is going to have to verify or sign off on your position, correct? So that's an MFR report. Yeah. yeah, so there are certain circumstances when an MFR report is required and that's very different to annual Good. reporting. Yeah. Annual reporting is quite quick and easy to do and there's a way to do it online. An MFR report is a much bigger, more, more in-depth financial document that's signed by an accountant. So one of the things that I'm aware of and I've touched base with you in preparing this is that um, there are some contractors who are lodging the annual report online um, and then finding themselves into, you know, quite rightly based on their position, uh, under some sort of you know, an audit based on having to provide the, the more comprehensive minimum financial MFR report. Um, one of the things is that, is that it's been suggested to me that maybe, you know, the accountant's not been involved in the first stage, but been involved in the second stage. So what would you say to, to contractors who, who are about to push the button in terms of go to the annual report? I know that they don't have to consult with their uh, accountants to actually make it happen, but yeah. should they? Look, you don't have to, but most contractors will be going and seeing their accountant at least once a year. Yeah. So when you see your accountant for your end of financial year statements, we would say to our contractor grade licensees, use that opportunity when you see your accountant every year anyway and, and run through and say, look, this is, the, this is the information I've got for the QVCC annual reporting. I was about to go and do it. Do you see any issues there? So that's a, that's a good way to avoid having multiple trips to the accountant where you can wrap it all up in that one visit because when you do your annual reporting, it's for your most recent financial year end. So it's the same, should be the same figures that you're talking about. Yeah, okay. Always when we do these things, I set out the questions and then we end up doing like yep, yep. half the discussions and we jump around. <laughs> so I'm just going to find where I am again. That's okay. of <laughs> so um, how are the managing it? You covered the categories. Um, yeah, you sort of did touch the fact that there will be certainly different compliance um, strategies based on the risk. And I think that's something that I'd like to leave people with very clear. Yep. You're prepared to work with, please tell me if I'm incorrectly putting words in your mouth, mm -hmm. you're prepared to work for the soft, with the soft certifiers on a more gentle basis, on a more longer basis in terms of, you know, if they're not complying and providing the AR and a return reports. But, but, but quite rightly, I would suggest when it comes to the bigger end of town who've got the potential to hurt more people when it comes to their, their, their contractual dealings, you're going to re require them to come to attention pretty quickly when it comes to providing information. Yeah, that's right. So with, say, Categories 4 to 7, turnover over $30 million a year, when they do their annual reporting lodgements, if they identify that they're not meeting the MFR, we're likely to get on that pretty quickly to say, hang on, you're not meeting the MFR, get in touch and make sure that they do come into compliance with the MFR. Categories 1 to 3 is a bit more, more risk-based there, um, so we look for... What sort of non-compliance are we talking about? Um, is there a large issue? Should you be in a different category? Do you have unpaid money mm -hmm. owed to subcontractors? That's a big red flag for us. Um, and then into the SCs, with the regulatory guide that we've published, it really identifies that it's going to be quite a major breach of the MFR um, for us to get involved at that point typically. Now, it is typical. Yeah. If there's other things going on, we will always reserve the right to take some action on the financial front. Annual reporting, um, we are looking to take action against anyone who doesn't lodge their annual reporting because that is something that's quite doable for every contractor. There's no real excuse not to do it. So get online, um, go into my QBCC and fill it out. It's like 10 minutes um, for the lower end of town to, to get their information on and it's probably information that you've already got. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, I think we've covered what I wanted to in terms of the minimum financial requirements. Excellent. Next one, safe uh, buildings. <laughs> <laughs> so once again, a um, bit of Courier Mail um, opinion piece, actually, as opposed to an article, um, which has drawn some attention to the, the staged processes associated with um, the identifying of buildings with, with dangerous combustible cladding. Uh, that's probably the best way to explain it for people who are yep. listening. And it's been a very long process. I'm not going <laughs> to go through all the stages, but could you just give us a bit, give me a bit of an update as to where you're, where, where the QBC is at at the moment in terms of dealing, you know, addressing this particular 
Uh, yeah. Start? So in Queensland, uh, we commenced what's called the Safer Buildings Scheme uh, in October 2018. And as you've pointed out, there are a number of phases to go through for certain building owners. Uh, it's a requirement for certain buildings to check whether or not there's combustible cladding on that building, essentially. Um, it requires owners to undertake an assessment of the material on the external walls of the building um, and using what well, we've already provided, the toolkit, the combustible cladding checklist. Uh, so the Safer Buildings Program has a deadline of 3 May this year. And it's really important that building owners um, or building agents who have a responsibility under the legislation um, declare if their building has a cladding fire risk or not by that deadline. So, um, you know, what is great to see is that the overwhelming majority of buildings have come through and, and done what was needed. That's great to see. Um, any building owners who haven't yet completed really need to do that. Okay. New trust framework. Shooting through this stuff. First of all, congratulations on anyone who put all that information on the website in terms of all the, the new trust framework. I've written a lot of articles about the trust arrangements and everything like that, and I think the time has well and truly come. We can all have opinions about <laughs> I'm not going to ask you. <laughs> but we can all have opinions about whether our trusts are good or bad, but right now the industry should be so across this it doesn't matter because it is going to happen and it's, 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 a, it's a stage rollout. So... But I've never seen better information. That is wonderful to hear, Michael. And you did actually email to me your praise, which I passed on to the project team who've been working very hard on that, and they were, they were very grateful. It's, it was, it's tremendous. I just kept on looking at it and thinking, where am I going to find a problem? I just kept on finding it. No, <laughs> good, it that's good. It was written in plain English. It was written in a way that I just think is just wonderful. So, And know, there's a number of guides for different yes. um, people in, in the process, which is great. The online tool, so you can work out, do I need a project trust? Yeah. And, and the links just kept on linking through. You know, it was one of those things where you can get into a bit of a bit of a blurb, and then okay, you want a bit more information. The link took you straight to, to a bit more information, and then that would take you a bit more if you want yeah. to keep on diving. But no, it was fantastic. So, just covering some basics. What type of work will be covered by the new, if I can call it the new trust regime? Yeah, and that's a that's a good thing to point out that. There, is, there was an existing trust regime called Project Bank Accounts. Um, there was an independent panel review and some law reform that brought about what is the new framework from 1 March that's kicked off um, of the Project Trust Account Framework. Um, so under, the, under this framework, cert, only certain contracts that meet certain criteria mm. need to have a Project Trust Account. Um, it's called Project Trust Work in the legislation. Um, and to determine whether or not a project complies or doesn't, more than 50% of the contract price needs to be for project trust work. Um, so if you think, generally speaking, construction or renovation of a building, um, work in association with a building, some specialist work performed by parties like architects and engineers is included in the value of that project trust work, as are certain inspections and advice. Okay, so the type of work it wouldn't cover generally, and we can yeah. generalise here, would be... Infrastructure, civil, civil work, yeah. in large, yeah. engi large engineering projects. Yes, as well as small-scale residential. So there has to be three or more living units for it to be project trust work. Yeah. So the bigger type of stuff is is, is being carved out and the smaller residential yeah. stuff is yeah. being carved out. And the project also needs to have at least 90 days to completion. Okay. So what are the, the – I know there's two – types of trust accounts, but yeah. let's, I'll give you the opportunity right. to explain <laughs> what the two so, types are. All right, so there's the project trust account and you have one of those for each um, eligible project or contract for project trust work and that's the, the account that um, the subcontractors and the head contractor are paid through that account for the work for that project. Then there's a retention trust account. And there's a big difference now between the old project bank account regime and the new regime under the new regime, you only need to have one retention trust account across all your projects. And you only need a retention trust account if you're going to have cash retentions from a project that was that required a project trust account. So that's a lot simpler um, for people now to comply because under the old regime, it was three trust accounts per contract essentially, whereas now it's one project trust account, but then only one overarching retention trust account. Don't want to interrupt your flow there, but just because we're going to come back to this. But yeah, it's I've, I've, I've spoken to a, a builder who's who's deliberately going to make the choice to keep them separate. 
Okay. Because okay. because he just doesn't want to muddle up the trust of sure. him money. So sure. there's no problems. There's no problem in them doing that, is there? No, no, I don't believe so. So as long as the money is held in trust and paid through that trust framework, yeah. that's that's the key. It's about protecting the yeah. money to make sure that it's not disappearing and that subcontractors feel that that money is being protected and can see that it's being protected. Um, and, and importantly, yeah. if a head contractor becomes insolvent, that money is protected. Yeah. So this, and this is cash retentions. Cash, yes. Yeah. So um, what are the – there's roll-out dates. There it's, are, it's been in, yep. So if you could just clearly – all right, Go do my your, best. Do your best. All right, so it'll come down to the contract price and the head contractor. So those are the kind of factors that you need to think about. So the first phase started on the 1st of March, um, and that is new state government projects between $1 and $10 million. So that's actually the same criteria as the old project bank account. Yep. Um, so the next phase is 1 July of this year, and then it'll include um, state authorities, so health and hospital service, things like that. So a bit bit of an expanded scope, but still within the state um, sort of government, state authority phase. But the $10 million cap goes. So it's all projects over $1 million that are state government, state authority um, projects. Yep. 1 January next year, um, it's those projects plus private sector and local government projects over $10 million. Then 1 July 2022, it's um, <clears throat> pr private and local over $3 million. And then from 1 Jan 2023, it's all state government, state authority, local government, private sector projects for project trust work over $1 million and retention trust accounts also have been rolled down by that date to um, any subcontractors who have cash retentions as well. So when does the retentions for principals kick in? So for, um, yes, for the for the head retentions held from a head contractor by a principal. Principal, yeah. Yep, from 1 January next year. 1 January next year. And then 1 January twenty. 2023, mm -hmm. it will be it will go the next layer down or the next tier down in terms yeah. of sub sub. If they're holding, if cash, they're holding cash, yeah, only the retention account, not the project trust account. Okay, yeah. there are a few like nuances, as you yeah. would be aware, around related um, entities and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, so by the way, that. so principals uh, are going to have to accept their responsibilities to to. Um, to comply with this regime as of 1 January next year. Yep. So how how you – it's one thing to – having worked with these organisers, one thing to be able to go to a bunch of people who you licence <laughs> and inform them. Um, how are you going about informing the principals that, that they're going to have to – yeah, look, we've we'll, we've got an education campaign. We also have regular stakeholder network meetings that we've commenced. So Property Council are involved in that, for example, as other law society and other relevant entities. So we're, we're communicating through peak industry body groups as well as directly from ourselves. We've got um, – we'll be running more webinars. Um, we're currently doing a roadshow around the state and we've got a bit of an overview of project trust accounts in that. We'll have a lot of information and targeted communications Yes, I'll be certainly, you know, I've been approached by some of the, the, the developers and principals, organisations or people um, to to uh, to comment on, the, on particularly in relation to the retentions because I think that's yeah. a bit of a sleeping issue in terms of not just principals understanding that, that they're going to have to treat cash retentions in a different way from builders, but builders are going yeah. to have to understand, and I've always used it, consulted, considered it to be a misuse of, of subcontractors' cash retentions. It's, it's, no, it's no longer the cheapest form of yeah. finance anymore. Yes, and that's right. Retention never was intended as something that would fund another project or even the current project. So um, really, if that's what someone is using to cash flow their business, well, the rollout and the staged approach will give plenty of time to find another way to properly fund the business so you're not relying on a subcontractor retention to fund a business. Are you listening to everybody out there? <laughs> Please <laughs> start thinking about where you're going to find Finance from if you have been financing your operations, in my view, and I think from your view, quite inappropriately with, mm -hmm. with cash retentions. You, but you're going to have to start figuring out this and have these conversations with your bank or whoever you're going to be 
because, yeah, that's because, right. because the date will come up and all of a sudden that money's going to be um, squirreled away from you being able to be able to use it. That's right. It will be held in the retention in the trust account um, and it will be payable only in the limited sense that it's meant to be payable for. Um, it can only be withheld for certain limited reasons. Perfect. I should add here, Michael, that, um, of course, the um, some amendments came through last year around the notification on final completion to subcontractors as well. So head contractors need to ensure that they notify their subcontractors when final completion is coming up as well. Yeah, there's a, there is a lot, like I said, I absolutely applaud the, uh, the information that's on the website. There is a lot for people to get their heads around, but that's why there the is. stage process is. Yep. And that's why people are really going to have to, I think for a long period of time, people were just, some people, just hoped that it wasn't, wasn't going to happen. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I can say that, you can't say that. I cannot. No, <laughs> but, no but, but that was, you know, it, but the reality is, and this is very much part of the, the theme that which I will continue on, is it's, whether you like it or don't like it, it's, it's a reality. And if you want yeah. to do business, understand how you're going to uh, navigate these particular requirements um, and yeah, sure, it's a challenging time to be able to do it in the on the on the back side of a you know, coming out of a recession, but that's the way it is. Um, yeah, and look, I mean, re- yes, we're also seeing a building boom in some parts of the industry. So you know, there's there's a bit of movement going there in the industry. So it's more important than ever to make sure that for subcontractors they're putting their invoices in regularly, and for head contractors to make sure that they're. They're, they're paying on time, that they're issuing payment schedules if they need to do that. Um, if they're not paying in full, they must issue those payment schedules within the within the timeframes. Um, so there's a lot of requirements around payment and security of payment that do need to be complied with and they're there to make sure that those, you know, who are relying on those payments in order to meet their mortgage payments and, and get by on a day-to-day basis actually are receiving the payment for the work that they're doing. Yeah. Which leads us nicely into the next question, quite frankly, is about you, the, it's a huge compliance uh, agenda or, or responsibility that's now from the, from the QBCC. So it's not just in relation to the stuff that we've been talking about, it's, it's layer upon layer upon layer. What, what, what's what's going to be the priority, say, for this year in, for, from a compliance perspective? And what are the different options that you might be able to, what sort of levers can you pull to, to deal with different scenarios in different ways? Yeah, look, that's that's a huge question. So um, the first thing I would just point out, as you've touched on, is that there is a, a shift. So project bank accounts, the principal largely had the oversight of the trust accounts. Under project trust accounts, the QBCC has that oversight. So there's a huge role for the QBCC in enforcing these requirements for project and retention trust accounts, as well as the other requirements around security of payment. Um, also within the QBCC, as you would be well aware, is the adjudication registry. Um, so it's another another sort of way that people can look to get paid um, when they haven't been paid. So there's a lot of, um, you probably will have seen, anyone who's read through the new um, or the amendments to the Building Industry Fairness Security Payment Act may have noticed that there's a lot of offences. And they exist to enable us to achieve compliance when we need to. Um, we have issued a regulatory guide around security of payment and project trust accounts. Um, we have said in that guide that where where someone is doing the right thing, generally, they're paying, so no one's been unpaid, um, but they've missed doing something because they just didn't quite understand the requirement. We'll take an educative approach uh, in the first instance there. So that's that's our intention is to educate, make sure people are aware But where someone's not paying people, so they're just not doing the right thing and they're just not complying with the requirements, well, we'll take a a much tougher approach in that instance. So we have the ability to impose some fairly significant fines on people and we do intend to do that where needed. Um, It's important that people do not think that they can get away with not paying others and not complying with requirements because they don't like them. Um, So that's the difference there. It really is quite like a a harms-based approach. Are you causing harm in the industry? If you are, we'll take a different approach um, if you're not. We're also doing um, proactive audits around compliance with the payment, security payment obligations. And at the moment, we've got an approved audit program underway, looking at a particular cohort randomly selected um, and whether they're providing their payment schedules and making their payments. 
So we'll continue to do that and look at different cohorts in the industry to get an idea around what's actually happening out there in the industry. Are you still building upon when we had the uh, Facebook Lives um, session last year, which once again, thank you very much for that, you were good enough to outline the insight um, Inside regulator, what is it? Insights inside? driven, driven, driven yep. regulator. <laughs> regulator. Yes. Yep. And I presume um, that all that body of work will come in very useful when you can when you try yes. to figure out prioritizing. Yes, well one of the really sort of exciting tools in that was the early warning tool. So it's an ability for us to see we've got someone who's a bit problematic. We can actually use the information we've got to have a look at, we can have a look at their networks and we can have a look at, you know, are they starting to fall behind, starting to not pay, starting to not pay their suppliers? Are there any debts? Oh, you know, a lot of information that, that comes in and we can grade them red, orange, green. If we start seeing that there's a lot of connections of reds and oranges, well, we know, okay, we need to get in there and start taking action. And, and that broad sort of sweeping up of data, um, it's a lot of it comes from, you know, uh, sharing information from, tell me if I'm wrong, but, you know, workplace health and safety, uh, um, so ATO. We do... Um so we have memorandums of understanding with information sharing. So um, workplace health and safety is slightly different. That's that's our safety data, and we do we do share information with other agencies um, to assist in our regulatory approach. And safety is one really yeah, important sure. area to do that. Um, other play other data we um, purchase. So it might be um, Ilian, for example. So we can purchase that data and ingest it in the network, and then get a better look around what's the credit of this entity really looking like. Yeah. So, like you know, my comments to you last year uh, are worth repeating again. This is this is a good thing for the industry because if it means that most, it means the regulator is absolutely zeroing in on in on the people who who are likely to cause the most damage to others. Well, then that's a good thing because the others can be left yeah. to, <laughs> to and, both, and that's and that's yeah. a much a better way than just trying to sort of guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I mean, look, our our approach is risk based and harms based. There will always be people who go, hang on, you took action against me and I didn't cause any problems to anyone, so why did you pick me? Um, there are instances where we do find non-compliances that are worthy of, in our view, taking action um, and it doesn't always mean that you need to have caused harm to someone else to, to get a fine or to get a notice or um, potentially even have a licence suspended because what we look at it and we say, well, there is a risk that if we let you go on, you might not pay someone or cause a problem to someone. So... We do have some criteria where, where we sort of say, well, I think that's sufficient for us to take some action here. Sure. Okay. Um, that's all the questions I had for you. Is there anything that you want to highlight that we haven't covered from a regulatory nature? You know, anything you want to... So the other, um, from a regulatory perspective, um, I would say to people, always get on our website, always read the information, educate yourself if, if you're unsure about something in the first instance and then to the extent that the information on our website doesn't answer your question, um, contact us. You can fill out, there's a contact us form on our website um, or you can phone us if you need to. And that's something I do encourage, particularly the online contact us form if you've got a question, rather than just thinking I'll do this and I'll hope that it's the right thing. Um, if, if you've got a specific question, that's, that is one of the things that we're here for is to, is to provide education and information to the industry as well as to homeowners and others um, around that. So um, I really encourage you to, to get educated around these new laws. People who perhaps don't like them, um, once something is law, it really doesn't matter if you like it or not. That was you, the point I was trying to make. Yeah. Well, but you've articulated yeah. <laughs> much better than what I have. It, yeah. There comes a time that you just got to accept it's, it's the reality. You you have to know what it is. You have to understand it. You you cannot remain in willful ignorance about something. Um, so you have to understand it and comply with it. And I know the website's been given a bit of a bit of a juge. Um, so and it's getting it's it's going to be better um it there's a there is a refresh underway of the website which is very exciting it's something we've been wanting for yeah. a long time um and our comms team are, are just absolutely chuffed that it's happening so um later in this year it'll be even better and my QBCC is um the menus had a bit of a redesign as well to make it easier for people to get in and get the forms that they need and that's what we're all about is trying to continually improve and continually make things a bit easier for our licensees to get the information that they need. Fantastic. I think 
there's nothing I've got to add other than it's been a wonderful chat again. Um, it's been my absolute pleasure. Thank, thank you again for making yourself available and um, going through all this sort of stuff. Um, I hope people find it interesting. I hope they find it informative. <laughs> I hope it, if, it, if it probes them and to, to go looking for more information, yeah. um, that's all I'm after when it comes to this sort of stuff. And and congratulations, like I said, I'm repeating myself, congratulations on the trust stuff. It's just outstanding. And and the website is certainly much easier to navigate. Um, Wonderful. As someone who navigates yeah. the website <laughs> regularly, I'm happy to find it. <laughs> the only way is up. Yeah. <laughs> So thanks very much, Kate, and um, it's always a pleasure having a chat to you. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed the podcast today. The information we discussed today was just that, information only. It is not specific advice. As you have heard me say many times before, I'm not a lawyer and none of what I say is legal advice. If you take action following something you heard today, It is important to make sure you get professional advice about your unique situation before you proceed, whether that advice be legal, financial, accounting, medical or other advice. Please reach out to the Helix team if you have any questions or if there's another topic you'd like explored. And if you know someone who might benefit from the show, remember to tell them about it or point them to our Instagram, Facebook or LinkedIn.